So without further ado, I think I'll hand it over to Marianne McGrath, our guest curator for Terra Firma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm happy to be here um, for another program to support the show. If you haven't taken a look yet, um, Terra Firma is a group exhibit with 15 artists contributing to the show. And together they speak to um, the land and individually um, introduce their own um, sub-themes ranging from um, to, uh, stewardship to environmental concerns to um, the beauty of the land and um, identity and uh, memory and all kinds of wonderful things to contemplate when you um, look at the work. But tonight we have a special guest, uh, Russell Crotty. Um, he has four pieces um, in our show here and he's going to talk to you about his work and um, his process as an artist and then we get to do something really special. We're going to go outside and uh, do some stargazing with some really wonderful uh, telescopes. Yeah. At the moon. Stargazing. Moongazing. Oh no! Okay. No, go away, Bob. So, um, thank you and thank you, Russell. Big circular drawings, big giant circular drawings. But, and I use ballpoint pen as my main medium, um, which uh, there's archival versions now. But when I started, they were sort of like thick, you know, very low brow. Uh, and from from observations of the telescope, I've been doing eye sketches, old school, uh, just visually observing, like letting the light from far away things hit your eye and uh, compiling all kinds of drawings and I take them to my studio and expand on those. And large scale, say four foot diameter field of view drawings of say Bloodbird star clusters or nebulae and stuff like that. And that led to doing these spheres because a lot of, you know, a lot of the globular star clusters are spherical and I thought they would look really good drawn on a sphere. So I worked with some bookbinders and, and paper uh, people to figure out how to, how to have these globes made and then coded archivally in uh, paper to so about the consistency of Bristol paper, which I really like. Uh, so, so those were mostly astronomical in the beginning. And then they started morphing into landscape. We, you know, my wife Laura and I do a lot of outdoor activity. A lot of uh, we used to boulder a lot and like climbing the Mount Road. I've served since 1965. So, you know, we're out, outside a lot. And so I started incorporating more landscape. And all throughout this time, I've been using text in my work on and off. And so, for instance, in, uh, in this piece here, the, the book, you can move in a little bit. You can see, see what I'm talking about. Um, this, yeah, this, this is a story. This is a story about going swimming at the swimming pool near our house in Rojas. Mm -hmm. So, so this is like um, a feature in the, the San Inez range that goes behind Santa Barbara, kind of ends in, at the west part of Ojai, and it's part of the transverse range in that area. It's just fabulous. Uh, so this is, you know, basically a tongue-in-cheek description of going to the swimming hole and then walking back to the town with the dogs and the hippies are hanging out, and, you know. It's, it's that kind of thing. So a lot of it's about a place. That's my identification with the place. And, and uh, also picking up some local vernacular. Um, there's another drawing in this book. Uh, a little bit of a shame. Uh, 
that that talks about it and humble. So it's like it's, it's like a repetitive text, a few clicks north of the Ganja town, which would be Arcata. Uh, then talk about natural features and beaches and driftwood tangles and civil war boots and you know, like all that kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, that's how text is, is. I've been employing it for the last many years uh, in the landscape. And in, in some cases, it becomes part of it, like a strata of, of the, the formations. So uh, this, these two globes here, uh, this one just says over and over again, uh, extreme high desert boulder problem. So it's sort of a riff on Joshua Tree and all that, and, and sort of extreme sports. And you could you could take it further and say it's a marketing device, you know, extreme, woo, you know, all that. So that's all kind of embedded in there. But but I hope you know I have the night sky in there. It's sort of a for me, it's a it's not I wouldn't call it escapism, but it's a reality that that we're all pretty insignificant in the scope of things. So. It's, it's a reminder. I'm sure you can be cute, tongue in cheek, in language, identify with the place, but it's all transitory in, in the scheme of this, the cosmos. So that's what I'm identifying. Now, this one is kind of unusual because it's a constellation Scorpius. Uh, uh, and there was a movie by Kenneth Anger called Scorpio Rising that I saw at the Financial San Francisco Art Institute in the 70s. And uh, it was all like sort of the whole the whole gay, kind of macho biker gay thing. And and how that was really unusual. And and so the film was really interesting that way. But now if you think of a gay pride parade, it's like it's like just accepted and it's it's like a carnival. You know, kind of like Disney. Uh, so that was sort of the basis. And then it turned out last summer I was in a show at the Hammer Museum. It's so weird. It's like, uh, but anyway, Scorpio, that's how Scorpio was, it was called Scorpio, the constellation, in older books, you know, up till maybe the 1920s or 30s. And then it changed it to Scorpius uh, on the Star Trek. So I do a lot of research in, about, um, you know, historical observation and when uh, scientists would actually draw things, uh, you know, kind of, kind of before the advent of, of astrophotography and gla big glass plates and all that stuff. And uh, I met this guy, Tony Mish, when I was doing a residency at the Lick Observatory in UC Santa Cruz, and uh, we had a similar view of things. We like to look through the eyepiece and see the real thing. Because uh, now today you can sit in, in the basement of the campus and you can see it in a comfortable chair with some drinks and run a telescope in Chile you know, or Mauna Kea. Um, this, is, this is a more recent piece. Um, this is a place we go to a lot. It's up in the mountains behind where we live. It's called Piedra Blanca. And there's these huge, beautiful sandstone formations and uh, you can come and, you know, you can sort of read the text. You don't, I don't intend people to read all the text through like a story. And I'm not a writer. I'm a, I'm a bad poet. That's kind of how I look at it. Without the drawing, I think it would be terrible. But because the drawings there can support this kind of language. That's how I look at it. Um, but, yeah, so there's issues here about... Um, you know, uh, some of the environmental issues, and then being out there and how important that is, and then the moon, and then um, it ends up a pale blue dot, a pale blue dot, Carl Sagan's famous uh, quote about the photograph of, of the pale blue dot from out beyond Saturn of Earth. Um, so I like to play with those kind of things. And as of late, I've been using a colored pencil and ink. The, I still use the archival ballpoint pen, but color pencil, gouache, and this is museum board. I, I'm really into museum board at the moment. I think it can take a lot of, a lot of work, work on it. Um, 
And that's, that's you know, basically your full moon, Mare Crisium, French Polytatus, Serenitatus, Oceanus Procellarum, um, Copernicus, uh, Tycho, big ejector crater. That, that when you look at the full moon, you see those streaks on two binoculars, and that would be some of these, these giant impact craters where the, the material just flew out and then laid down like that. So, uh, yeah, so we actually like that. Uh, open it up for question, questions if you have questions. You know. Are you an astronomer or an artist? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Equally? Yeah. I'm an amateur astronomer, but a professional okay. artist. Okay. That's kind of how I look at it. He was a professional astronomer. Tell me. Yeah. Uh, and he's an artist, but he's not an amateur artist. So. <laughs> That's very kind. Of well, you're welcome. We're staying with them. They're putting us up, so I have to be nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So, you know, when I, I saw some of your uh, what more like six years ago or something like that, and I, I just wonder. As new materials are developing, are, are some of those attractive, or are you finding the same materials? No. Good for you. Um, no. I, yeah, yeah, I experimented with some stuff called bioresin for a while, but I sort of, I sort of went off the rails a bit. Um, no, I'm pretty much comfortable in using the, the techniques I use. However, um, yeah, Laura, uh, my wife Laura, one day said, "Why don't you try using colored pencils?" And I felt like I was like, "No." <laughs> you know, forget. It could fail. Yeah, it's, you know, and I started using them and started liking them. So it's like you, you don't know. But for me, because I, because I work over years and years and years at a pretty gradual kind of pace. There's there's no you know there's no splatter painting. There's something so elementally attractive. The spheres. The, the spheres are pretty. Yeah, the charismatic spheres. Yeah. They are, yeah. At one point, in, I had a show in New York, and, and the New Yorker gave a cartoon. And they had one of the spheres, and had this pregnant woman looking. <laughs> and somebody else's feet were behind the gloves. And, you know, and that, to me, was you know better than being an art forum or anything. <laughs> that was pretty cool, you know. So, uh, so anyway, yeah. So. This book here, they're not night sky uh, drawings, actually. This is sort of terrestrial daylight goings on. And, uh, but generally, I'm using, I use the night sky uh, work. And I do observe a lot, and I do public observing nights uh, with the telescopes at a place called Tap Gardens down in, in Ohio uh, with Laura in, in, up on a mesa. Of this botanical garden. Uh, so I'm doing a little, little more of that. Uh, but basically, yeah, it, it, it just keeps the juices going. And since COVID, we haven't been traveling or doing any of that. Uh, we've been, you know, I've, I've been focusing more on local things. Uh, the mountains might be in the street, you know, places we can go, which we can't go to now because all the roads are shut. But yeah, um, any, any questions? One question or comment. Hi. Yeah. Um, what I'm really finding compelling about these is that you play with scale, like the inversion of the mountains being really big on Earth. So it's it's really attractive and almost more intimate to see. Sometimes, you know, seeing a remote moon or a picture of the globe, this is much more immediately relatable, you know, tangible. Right. And right. also interesting because you know that the scale is different. And, and here, with the words being very large in the landscape and the moon being very close, I'm wondering why your relationship is with scale and using it in your work. Yeah, it's been important throughout my career um, in terms of drawing. Um, in, in the early 1990s, I started doing these giant uh, sequential cert drawings with, with big ballpoint pen, and I grid off a 10 by 20 foot, uh, three section roll, rolls of paper and then fill them in with these, these cells, each one being unique. There's one at the San Jose Museum right now in a mm -hmm. show about time. That's, up, that, um, that's, that's a good example of that from that period. Uh, 
So that, that scale from a distance looked like a, something you printed out either back in those days, a fax machine. Um, and uh, then you get up close and the, the cell is in digit, you know. So, so that was sort of the thing. Uh, later, uh, large scale books. Uh, books, what's larger than this? They were filled with astronomical drawings and, and notational text of observing and experiences and things like that. And those are, those, some of those were five by 10 feet. Yeah. And linen covered books, and I'd have made them this mad Swiss bookbinder in LA. Um, and uh, scale with the globes, too. The globes have gone up to six feet uh, in diameter uh, and down to like eight inches, actually. So, so yeah, the scale. And what I always tried to avoid was this sort of um, you know, science fair aspect of them, where, where you, if you had them hung at different levels like that, it would get a little chaotic. So I always wanted them to be read like a drawing. And normally you hang drawings at uh, 54 to 56 on the center, something like that. And so I did that with the equator, and that was important. So the context of all this stuff is important, how, you, how it's presented, and how, how you think about the scale. And you know, when you're dealing with something like the cosmos, it's, it, you know, a lot of us left up to the imagination, but I, you know, I kind of try to stay as true to, maybe through the amount of observing I've done, I stay true to that aspect of it. Somebody had a question back here. Did, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to say about traveling. Um, where have you gone that has particularly dark skies? Have you gone to, to go to dark skies? Yeah, well, I mean, like Idaho, like the, the Wood River Valley, down, you know, that area, did a residency up there. That was a, the horizon, the horizon Milky Way. Wow. Just spectacular. Um, and, uh, you know, the North Coast, that's where I spent my childhood, in um, Marin and Mendocino. Mm -hmm. And Mendocino, when it wasn't foggy, would be really dark. Not dry, though, like kind of, mm -hmm. you know, images would be fuzzy, kind of, but very bright. So, and then where we live, there's there's dark sky ordinance. So uh, the Ojai Valley is actually, you can see the Milky Way on a summer night from, from your front yard. You know, uh, and we're trying to keep it dark. <laughs> so that's that's an important issue, which which relates to the environmental concerns that I sort of rant about in some of the text. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. What, have, what have been your most interesting challenges moving these pieces around? Whether it's the big ones or the small ones, I'm sure you have lots of challenges. Yeah, they're, uh, they're not that challenging. You just have them created and move them around. <laughs> just, you know, like most stuff in the art world, but uh, large scale things. Uh, I did three really large ones for the US Embassy in Beijing in 2008, and those were shipped over in big crates. And, they have giant scaffolding, and they're in the foyer. And I was asking them about the, the danger of, of light from all the light coming in. They said, oh, don't worry, it's bomb proof glass. It's like that thing. Oh, oh gosh. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, shipping, you know, <coughs> the issue about shipping now that's concerned everybody is, is, you know, the amount of energy it uses and consumption you know, dirty ships, bringing dirty fuel, and I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a question. And, you know, because everything's international, stuff's getting shipped all over the time. But my stuff's kind of small potatoes compared to a lot of pieces for artists in terms of scale. Mm -hmm. you, know. you could fly them over in a spy balloon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're, only $12, they're only $12. They're only $12. I'm lying. <laughs> big tables were designed to be shipped. I mean, at least yes. metaphorically shipped. Yeah, there, there were some very large scale um, books I did of the, uh, all, this, all the things I observed in the Northern Hemisphere with my telescope. And, and uh, so they were, the book rolls out to 10 feet, it's 5 by 10 feet, and then rolls back up, goes in a tube underneath the table, and the table's this huge custom-made table, 
and, and it, it all fold, it all collapses, folds up, and you can ship it out. And the joke about that was that it was, it was supposed to be field charts. So, so you know, it's this whole idea. Yeah, I like I love field charts, and I love like uh, science guides, and you know, looking for minerals, that, that kind of stuff. And so I decided to exploit that idea and take it to an extreme, kind of absurd level. It becomes postmodern when it's basically unusable. You know, <laughs> rather than utilitarian and modernist, you know, like a good, a good uh, pot or something. But, uh, yeah, so it's nice to be included in this show with so many varied artists. Uh, and some of them are definitely interesting to check it out. So, yeah, any other uh, questions? Yes. I'm sorry, I was a little bit late because I wanted to talk about this, but um, can you talk about the process of making these? Sure, sure. Do, uh, these? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically, we have, them, we have them cast by a, um, a guy up here in San Bruno, actually, that uh, they're made out of fiberglass. And then, and then in halves, and then they stick them together, bond them, sand them, seal them. Then they go off to the, the paper conservator or bookbinder. And they use this Japanese maza paper, which is a, a thin, really beautiful paper. But if you, you can layer really easily. And these are very classical. They're done with, uh, with uh, wheat paste, basically. You know, there's a little, little um, polyvinyl acetate in the first coat to get it to stick. And then there's two layers above that, generally. And then we do little polar caps where the, where the, the uh, tube goes through, where we can run the line through it. So that's the last thing. And then they arrive in the studio blank, and I draw on them in the round. Which gets interesting when you're doing a big one, really big one like this. You sort of have glass scene and blankets all over the floor, and you can roll it, stand on a ladder, and kind of work on it all day on a little section. So I recall you used to do ballpoint pen on these. That is ballpoint pen. That is all ballpoint pen. Yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a permanent ink. It's one they make to sign all the documents in Sweden, uh -huh. all the government documents from a company called Bolograph. And uh, so we order cartridges from them. And, and I have two ballpoint pens that are like, with per personally, like they'll, they'll put your name on it. And everything. <laughs> it's pretty neat. So I have two of those. Um, yeah. And then, you know, the, the color pencil thing is really interesting because I, I just was so resistant to, I'm resistant to change, you know? I'm kind of like a funny, funny guy that way. So, uh, but actually, it, 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 adds, it adds to the atmosphere. Like the globes have this sort of atmosphere because of the markings, you know, the way it's done. So it's sort of, sort of like an agitated sky with stars, um, which you don't want as an astronomer. You want it perfectly, you don't want twinkle, twinkle little star. You want no wind, no, no movement. That's ideal. And the same, same can be said for this uh, application. And then, of course, color, even color. And a little bit of depth, actually. Whereas these, like these can be kind of flat sometimes, like that. Um, it's just as a, as a, a venue for text. Um, these have a little more depth, so you know they're a little more. They're kind of classical, but I think the language, the text, makes them more keeps them in a postmodern realm or dialogue, you know. And also, like, what what is a what's good writing, what's bad writing, you know? I mean, how do you define define that? So, a bit of that, the language, you know, language. Yeah, so these, these are, there's four spreads in this book. And I've done really big ones with like six spreads of, of different places. Um, but, but the places are all really similar, like I said. It's usually high desert, chaparral, uh, peaks with boulders, you know, ponderosa, Jeffrey Pines, that kind of stuff. That kind of are around, around our, you know, 100 mile radius around us. 200 miles from Eastern Sierra. Yeah. But astronomy's kept me, uh, it's, it's, you know, every, 
every time I look at Jupiter, it's different. And if all of us went out and drew Jupiter right now in a little circular template, they'd look completely different. And that's really fascinating. So, you know, so I like to, I, I do like to study those sort of things, like uh, research amateur astronomers that have done incredible drawings. And you know, like when you meet them at a star party and you say, wow, I love your drawings. They're like, I can't draw, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's this whole kind of subculture thing that was in the surf world, not anymore. It's all mainstream now. But, yeah. Is that dog kind of scraps? <laughs> 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 He's really great on his colorblindness relatives. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. laughs> it's not the reality. It's fascinating. Dog was <laughs> So uh, I'll be I'll be showing some some of these works, the, the panoramas this summer in San Francisco at the Hospital Gallery, uh, opening in July. July eighth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's July eighth, and, and with Lordy Rodriguez, who's you know, who teaches at San Jose State. No? He used to. Used to. Used to. Okay. So he's doing that, which will be used. Because he does mapping stuff. And you know, another issue that popped up in my, well, not an issue, uh, observation was that the panoramas uh, are sort of like flattening a globe. You know? If you took that drawing and flattened it and stretched it out, it would be a lot like that. So that's, that's another issue. And that's also something they do. In planetary studies, they, they'll take multiple photos of Jupiter and then make a mosaic and flatten it out. Planetsphere. So there's a lot of like crossover ideas with, with the more science -y stuff. Does anybody have any other questions? I have a question. Sorry, I came late and I couldn't hear your presentation. Oh. But I was curious by looking on your spheres, like how did you find exact location of the stars right there and transfer them there? Like to be so they're not precise. exact. They're not exact. <laughs> they're, they're, they're familiar. You know what I mean? Like, like Scorpius. You know, here's Antares, and here's the, the, the body, you know, body of the Scorpion here, and then it goes down, and the stingers over there. And in, in, in actuality. In a dark place like that, and it's the Milky Way going, going up here. <clears throat> but I just, I just wanted to focus on uh, Scorpius or Scorpio. Again. Yeah, I have hopefully not an off the wall question, but it, it strikes me that you get some inspiration from looking at star, contemporary star maps, amateur star maps, historic star maps. Mm -hmm. Do you get some inspiration for looking at star maps from completely other cultures who don't name the constellations mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. way we do it and don't depict oh, yeah, the constellations? See, yes, there's there's total rearrangements <laughs> things in the sky. Yeah, I'm not fascinated. So I do look. At But right now, you know, you can, what's going on with the web and all that is just mind blowing. And the mapping going on of the, the Milky Way is taking it way beyond what we knew not that long ago. So that's, that's something I'm not sure that's going to jump into my work in a hurry, but, but it's, you know, I do look at that and try to keep up on some of it. So it's sort of like, you know, Sisyphus going up the hill. I've been trying to keep up with this. The chi you know, so many discoveries happening. It's incredible. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there's no, any more questions? Thank you. Sure. And this is our first part of our experience with Russell tonight. So we're yeah. going to start setting up telescopes outside. Take a peek at the moon. Yeah, we'll take a peek at the moon. Round of applause. It's a different time for us to tear it down. Thank you. So before we dive in, I would like to just read our land acknowledgement. 
As members of the Los Garros community, we acknowledge that we are guests on the ancestral and traditional land of the first people of this region, the present-day Muwekma Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area, historically federally recognized as the Verona Band of Alameda County. We support the restoration and sovereignty of this Chochenyo, Tamyan, Rometush, Awaswa speaking, BIA documented Ohlone tribe, as well as all indigenous peoples. So we're going to be hearing from three wonderful panelists. We have Tracy Fish, who is a documentary and fine art photographer. You can see her photos at the back of this room. I encourage you to check them out. Her creative work expands multiple genres, using her interest in culture and history as a catalyst to explore memory, place, identity, and the environment. She is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Art, Art History, and Design at the University of Nevada, Reno, and has exhibited her work both nationally and internationally. And then we also will hear from Dr. Jan English Lewis, who is a professor of anthropology at San Jose State University and a distinguished fellow at the Institute for the Future. Jan studies societies who actively create new cultural futures from China to Silicon Valley and Black Rock City. Her books on Silicon Valley include Cultures at Silicon Valley, now in its <coughs> second edition. And we will also hear from Dr. Carrie Rohrmeyer, who is a cultural geography assistant professor at San Jose State University in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. She has studied her northern Nevada in her northern Nevada home region for over two decades. So I just want to do a quick shout out that we have upcoming programs through March. We have a Terra Firma artist and curator tour on March 12th, and we have a virtual panel discussion on land stewardship on March 16th. So if that's something you're interested in, please register on our website. So without further ado, I'll pass it off. Thank you. So we did a little experiment that will not work. I was hoping I could keep the mic table, but I won't hold it. Um, so first, I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. And I would like to also start off with our own land acknowledgement on the research that we've been doing over the last couple of years. Um, Story, uh, Story County, Nevada, where our research has predominantly taken place, is the ancestral land of the uh, Nuwu, uh, Washu, and Nuwi, and Nuwu peoples. Uh, these lands continue to be a gathering place for indigenous peoples, and we recognize their deep connections to this geography. We extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn on their territory. So, let's journey 20... 22 miles east of the California border on Interstate 80, with probably still lots of snow, uh, to Story County, Nevada, where we will share our work on the world's largest industrial park, known as the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center. At 107,000 acres of arid Great Basin Desert, uh, the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center, which I will probably be shortening as Tri Center for the rest of this evening, um, is the site of more than 150 factories, warehouses, fulfillment, and data centers, such as Google, Tesla Motors, Walmart, Blockchains, and Switch. This presentation is largely visual, and our multidisciplinary panel interrogates the built landscape from multiple angles photography, anthropology, and cultural geography. All of these fields were and still are underrepresented by women, and each of us shares a deep connection to places in the Eastern Sierra. Our scholarly pursuits have fieldwork in common as a method for examining perspective, people, and place. Uh, please keep in mind that assimilation in any discipline instills a distinct view that frames our knowledge, and so it is our responsibility to engage with and learn from other fields to widen our gaze. So when Carrie first proposed this project, uh, she'll be speaking a little bit later on, um, I was interested in the opportunity to look a little closer at the varied history of this land and its usage. As this collaboration continued, one of my favorite books on looking a walker's guide to the art of observation was in the back of my mind. 
For those unfamiliar, the author, Alexandra Horowitz, goes on the same walk in New York City 11 times, each time with a different expert in a particular field. Every walk and every experience are distinct, all shaped by how each of these experts uniquely sees the world. In the section Seeing Not Seeing, Horowitz describes that when we arrive somewhere new, by using what we see, hear, or feel, we first compare it to internalized representations we have in our head of places we've already been. So if there's a connection to a place, it's very possible that we may ultimately ignore what we see unless there's something unusual that pops up, much like a lone horse in an industrial highway. We can see a cognitive map moving through places without truly looking. So from a young age, how we see is informed by our individual experiences, education, and interests. Through interdisciplinary collaboration, multiple voices and perspectives can come together changing the way one may experience a place to see something new. So as a photography professor, perhaps techniques I've recently described to my students might be lingering in the back of my mind and can inform my image making by demonstrating a sense of scale of the high desert mountains as seen here. Blink and you might miss the Walmart distribution trucks along Interstate 80 on the bottom left or the green for sale sign on the opposing side. If I drive around with Carrie, using her background in urban planning, she might point out riprap, a word that I can promise you I've never heard of before working with her on this project, um, that stabilizes graded soil on slopes to prevent erosion. That now becomes a new photograph. And it's possible that such an image otherwise wouldn't have existed, or if it did, its creation would have a different purpose. This ability for exchange informs the process of image making and the ongoing documentation of TriCenter. Together, it creates a much richer narrative for storytelling. <clears throat> Conformity in any discipline instills a distinct view that frames our knowledge, and so it's our responsibility to continue this expansion of communication through our work. Aside from mul multidisciplinarity, the act of returning is also important to this project. One key thing to understand about TriCenter is the development happens at an exponential pace and continues to astound me every time I return. In just days, a specific construction site will look completely different. This is due to loose pre-approved permitting that within 30 days, any given land can be graded, constructed, and open for business. So whether returning alone or with a collaborator, something new will always be pointed out. Sites can be as permanent as any of the newly developed tilted structures as seen here, or more temporary such as these modified Conex container express boxes that are used for short-term offices. The land is in a constant state of physical change. But without the act of returning, those small changes that frankly aren't so small in scale might go undetected. And to someone else, these moments camouflage with the rest of the development in the everyday. So beyond learning about the land and ways of seeing, I was also interested in this project as it reflected on a juxtaposition of my own female identity and storytelling within the canon of the history of photography. So to briefly elaborate, um, to kind of give you guys a little bit more context, over decades, there's been numerous male photographers documenting this particular region in places like Lake Tahoe, Black Rock Desert, known for today for Burning Man, might be a little bit more familiar, um, or the Pyramid Lake Indian Reservation. And all three of these places are, in particular are only a 40 minute to an hour drive from Tri-Center, so again, very regionally close. So when we go back as far as the geographical land survey images, like that of Timothy O'Sullivan that could be seen here, we begin to see recording of land, migration, exploration, consolidation, and appropriation that consumes the American West. And like many images of the West, they associate very specific descriptive language that we see used throughout the photographic history of wilderness, great outdoors, sublime, grandeur, and unspoiled land. But when we really look at the history, we know that all of these descriptors are inaccurate. So, especially now being um, in this talk at the, in the Bay Area, you guys might be more familiar with photographer Ansel Adams, <coughs> who's known for his advocacy of wilderness preservation and also documented the Eastern Sierra Nevada sites like Half Dome in Yosemite, California. In some ways, like the Western Frontier views of Timothy O'Sullivan, Ansel Adams' images were described as majestic, showing the natural world as scenery ready for human delight. In a letter to his wife, Virginia, in 1922, 
he actually complains to her about the crowds in Yosemite. How I wish that the valley could be now like it was 40 years ago, a pure wilderness with only a wagon road through it and no automobiles nor moths. His photographic framing contributes to the vernacular of this very sublime landscape of the American West and desires to return to a much purer time that frankly never existed. That ideology is misleading as we now understand that these are indigenous lands long occupied by the Omani peoples that are comprised of seven different tribes, including the Northern Paiute, who are also native to where, we're, where our currency research at the Tri Center exists. So as we move further into the rapidly changing 20th century, the US landscape was cleared for industrialization, suburbanization, and expansion. It became nearly impossible for landscape photography to remain confined to the idealized views like that of Ansel Adams and mostly the views that he longed for. We witnessed a shift to documenting reality um, and unromanticized views, not dissimilar to my photograph here of wild horses grazing in the, for uh, in the foreground of the Fulcrum Sierra biofuels in the Tri Center. This visual pivot in photographic history marked a radical shift away from traditional depictions of landscape and is said towards a man-altered landscape. Many photographers use an ethical awareness to show us what the land looked like once it became inhabited, focusing on the frontier between the human and the natural worlds. So as a female photographer, understanding this history informs my practice, especially when reflecting on who were the key players that performed these actions to the land and who was telling the story. So Conquest of Man, Recorded by Man, Told by Man, documented, uh, man-altered landscape. These are all phrases that I've heard used. The lack of female voice is very much embedded in the history's language. Photography has always favored gendered views and the voices of industrialization are very much the same. This also includes a lack of minorities and representation. So for women, traditionally we are excluded from both the physical experience of the landscape as well as the participation in its working and its shaping. So to date, I haven't seen much long-term documentation focused on Tri-Center. For me, I've been doing this for about two and a half years now, and it's still going to be ongoing, while determining how to best document this evolving landscape. And aside from working with limited site access due to privatized land ownership, I've debated how I felt regarding the visual lack of people, which is something that as a viewer this evening, you might have already noticed. And this, there's pretty much a reason for this. Um, if there's Anybody that's in the landscape, it's very briefly, we're seeing builders or workers that are ultimately just driving to and from um, any of their uh, jobs that are out there. So otherwise, it's a very, very quiet landscape. Everything is happening indoors and behind the scenes. Um, so what we begin to see with our representations of people is very much a landscape, at times ephemeral, other times permanent. This includes seasonal wildlife, like coyotes, deer, bighorn sheep. I like to joke lions and tigers and bears because there's just lots of animals that are out there. Um, we begin to see erratic weather of a high desert from summer heat to dust storms or snow, or fire season that pulls in smoke from nearby wildfires. So in this ever-expanding, fast-paced environment like Tri Center, I still find quiet temporal moments that change as quickly as the desert's ephemeral quality of light. Here you see a once granite mountainscape from rugged sagebrush sea, pulverized to gravel, fit for industrial empire. And some of the more permanent moments, power lines that guide the eyes across the landscape, enormous structures with a menagerie of colors, sometimes white and reflective, red and vibrant, a sprinkling of pastel, or instead a desert brown that does its best to camouflage into the desert some other landscape. All this to say that while there's no physical sight of people, Instead, these 107,000 acres of industrial structures instead remain as evidence of human presence. Macro and micro levels of observations have helped to explore a sense of scale, temporality, or permanence. That includes natural examples as seen in images from left to right, like the vibrant lichens growing on rock just outside of the Tesla Gigafactory, or the animal remains that we see in the center, or even this haphazardly broken rock. Perhaps more unnatural, like these construction remnants throughout the landscape, but ultimately each one of these small typologies are otherwise lost in the vastness of these spaces, but each still tell part of a much larger story. 
So this project has created a lens to open conversations and invite different perspectives. With consideration to Silicon Valley just miles away, my images ponder whether we can find a sustainable future. So I want to thank you all again for attending this evening. And next up, I'd like to introduce anthropologist uh, Dr. Jen Angus Lua, who, who will help to provide even further context to this project. Thank you, Tracy. And I'm doing a little sound check to make sure you can still hear me in the back. Yes. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank my friends at New Mew for uh, hosting us here. It's, it's quite wonderful to be here with my colleagues. And of course, to, to thank Tracy and uh, Scott, who is our absent colleague, for these amazing photographs. And to reinforce the idea that each of us, whether it's photographer, anthropologist, or geographer, we're bringing a different perspective to this discussion. Now, in my anthropological lens, I am looking at people. People infusing landscapes with power, with values, with rules, with artifacts. And this provides an opportunity to reflect on the lessons from the past and also the connections between northern Nevada and here in the Bay Area, including Silicon Valley. So if you, like I do, read the Sunday Mercury News, you will see Tahoe Reno listings listed as Bay Area backroads. Mm -hmm. If you look at the statistics for the flight as people left Silicon Valley during the COVID epidemic, which may still be with us, um, nonetheless, you will see an increase in rentals and people fleeing to Tahoe as that Bay Area backroad. Those connections are long, they're deep, and they're historic. This relationship goes back much further. So today, I'll highlight one particular very human form of economy that joins Silicon Valley and Northern Nevada, and that is the boom and bust economy. I want each of us to consider who gets left out, as Tracy said, from the stories that we tell about these landscapes. And in each slide, I'll tell you a little bit about what I see in these photographs, and then how I apply the anthropological lens to these landscapes. So you see here an image of power lines crossing the hills. And anthropologists listen to the stories that people tell about their identities, and we listen even harder to their backstories. The hidden landscapes of power. Get the joke? <laughs> that shape communities. In the West, we call out the frontier, these powerful images of wild horses and the romance of risk. 21st century historical archaeologists investigate the role of power and land transformation to reveal the perspectives of people whose voices usually don't get considered, who have not been dominant, including women, ethnic minorities, and the everyday workers who experience directly living in the logics of capitalism, of those booms and those busts whether those consequences are prosperity or marginalization. Northwest Nevada has long been influenced by the San Francisco Bay Area. The bankers and entrepreneurs of the 1870s, not 2070s, not 1970s, 1870s, Comstock era, and the contemporary tech companies such as Google, Apple, and although Elon Musk disassociates himself from Silicon Valley, Tesla, which is out in the Tri-Valley Center. Uh, it is only about 17 miles from Virginia City, which was at the heart of the Comstock load. The bank crowd, that was the name for the people from San Francisco, shaped Nevada's early statehood politics. And like today's companies, they constructed a vertical monopoly that controlled all stages of production, from the mines, to the mills, to the railroad, that took bullion out and brought supplies in. San Francisco replicated their boom and bust economy, their cycles of production that depend on rapid growth. And they work only as long as that particular source of wealth endures. This state of events, cycles of intense wealth generation followed by collapse, not only describes the historic company towns of northern Nevada, 
It also describes some of life in Silicon Valley as I've been documenting the last three decades um, here in this place. And throughout my career, people from China to Lithuania keep asking me, how do you create Silicon Valley? With eyes only on those boom times. Only on those boom times. Nevadans now cite Reno as the Silicon Valley of the High Sierra, and Tesla's arrival prompted Dean Hamor, the Director of Community Development for Story County, to note that these events, and I quote, validate Nevada as a place for technology and manufacturing. We are the next place for high tech, end quote. The anthropological gaze, like the gaze of so many photographs in this exhibit, are bifocal. That is to say, you gaze out at the big picture and then you zoom in to look at those details. And here we have zoomed out to see an outcropping with petroglyphs, rock art from the Winnemucca Lake bit, just past Nixon. And although as we zoom in at the details, and I must have a caveat that it's difficult to interpret rock art, uh, nonetheless, we see on the left petroglyphs, ancient rock art whose categories, whose imagery archaeologists uh, try to figure out the logic of, try to interpret. And some of that is mapping, mapping migration, mapping animal passages, but some of it is very metaphorical. And I wanted to draw, uh, certainly based on the, the talk that we had just before this and the moon gazing that you'll do afterwards, some of that rock art reflects images of astronomy. And bighorn sheep are, in particular, an image that reflects an astronomical metaphor for these folks. On the right, we see contemporary bullet holes on the tufa. These are the close-ups of their cultural worlds. You may have noticed this photograph out as you came in. The populations that came in the 19th and 20th centuries continue to leave rock art traces on the landscape. In this image of a wash and abandoned detritus, detritus is one of my favorite words, it's what archaeologists call trash. <laughs> I want us to reflect on the consequences of redefining people as disposable capital, remembering that the population of historic Virginia City was once a thriving community of 25,000 people and it now has 660. Here you see images of Chinatown in Virginia City. As with all boom and bust economies, the workforce is one that experiences booms and busts keenly. In the Comstock era, the workforce was global. Comstock pioneered industrial mining 150 years ago. It replaced the kinds of more cottage industry mining brought out of South America, Mexico, um, and China. Historical archaeologists document the Chinese in these labor camps and in mining camps, and they were overwhelmingly male. There were women there. Some of the women were the wives of professionals, the wives of doctors, for example, Chinese doctors. But somewhere between half and 70% of the women that were there were prostitutes. And those prostitutes, in the process of immigration, took the opportunity to take the high status practices of courtesans and integrate it into their identities as street sex workers. Here you see Virginia City in 1867. Early Comstock communities included entrepreneurial women, mostly migrants from other parts of America, some of them Irish immigrants, and through this boom they provided a variety of services, including needlework, cooking, cleaning, managing boarding houses. Contrary to the stereotypes you may have experienced in media, very, very few of these white women were in quote unquote entertainment. But this is the world famous Mustang Ranch, which in the past did use female sex workers. It was a site that drove the legalization of prostitution in Nevada. This was uh, nestled in the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center. The brothel serves as a official meeting space in all business meetings. 
The legalization of prostitution in Nevada, although it varies from county to county, reminds us of the ephemerality of work, the experience of these booms and busts. And uh, I'd like you to listen to some comments that were made by ethnographers in, uh, who came from the University of Nevada, um, Las Vegas, who looked at life in these Nevada brothels, including those in Story County. And here's one of the quotations I'd really like us to think about. One of them said, work now, life later. Work now, life later. Consider how work now, life later applies to all manners of workers who live through these booms and busts. So I want to draw your attention to this damaged Tesla sign and reflect on boom and bust economies. One social invention that fuels Silicon Valley's economy, not one subject to patents, is the public-private partnership. Such a partnership mitigates the risks of investors, it opens up public seed capital, and gives the private sector a considerable advantage. Joint Venture Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley Leadership Group are examples of that here in our own region. The, in Reno, the Tri-Public-Private Partnership Project leverages Nevada's state seed money, a sparsely populated basin, mega footprint buildings, and a small county with very efficient and pro-business attitudes. Now I'm going to take a moment to compare Northern Nevada to Silicon Valley. It is arguably quite different. Here, we have the most complex technological eco economic ecosystem in the world. It includes uh, a range of diverse industries from biotech to uh, what well, you name it. We've, we've gone through almost every kind of industrial sector that you could possibly think of. It is culturally diverse. About 40% of this area is foreign born. And if you look at the diversity index, which is an index of how likely is it that you will meet people who are different from you, it is 70, much higher than the national average. Story County is not like this. Story County does not have industrial density. It doesn't have the autonomy of Silicon Valley, and its population is small and relatively homogenous. It has a diversity index of 37. 70 here, 37 there. And that's up 15 <coughs> points since the last census. 90% of the population is white, a third are over 65. But I want us to understand that places like the Tri-Center are essential to Silicon Valley. But we do need to read the, read, uh, recognize those differences. Silicon Valley requires a dense global population to succeed, but Story County requires emptiness, the room to build the infrastructure needed by Silicon Valley. And I want to draw our attention back to this perceived emptiness of the high desert. And you see some of that in the exhibits that are upstairs. That, that, that thought about emptiness really comes out in the art. In addition to influencing the cultures of business, the Bay Area has exported back to nature romanticism, not just from the 1960s or from Burning Man in the Black Rock, but extending back into those 1800s mining eras. The philosophies of American transcendentalists like Henry David Thoreau, John Muir, elevated the spiritual value of nature. But it's a particular kind of nature. Trees, water, mountains, snow, sky. The high desert is much more ambiguous. I would overhear burners at Black Rock City referring to the high desert as empty or in the middle of nowhere. Those sentiments remind me of terra nullius, empty land, which suggests that it's just there to be exploited. And in my final image, you see Trick's team-driven logo there, located at the Walmart distribution center, and it calls out the most romantic of high desert images, herds of wild mustangs. I confess being excited whenever I would see herds of wild mustangs when you guys took me out there. 
Throughout my talk, I've invited you to kind of pause and reflect on how people in Nevada relate to people here in the Bay Area, how those people have experienced this great boom and bust, and how we experience those booms and those busts. And it's easy to think about ourselves when we navigate those, those cycles of economy, but it's a lot harder to see them at a distance. So I want to invite my colleague, Carrie Romeyer, up to tell you a little bit more about the, the context of how those landscapes, those cultural landscapes, illustrate this set of economic factors. I know many of the people in the audience and I'm very appreciative to see people out tonight and so interested even in what's happening over the border um, because even though we're literally three hours and 45 minutes driving distance away in some ways it feels like a different world but I hope you'll find that the two are interconnected from our talk tonight okay so just, uh, so my work actually goes back probably the longest. I think I'm the very first person who was involved in planning Tahoe Reno Industrial Center. I was called out to, because some people had some issues with some wetlands and they wanted somebody who had done industrial development. And I had worked as a planner in Reno for about five years, but everyone knew this space was changing, but no one had an idea of what was to come. So that was in 2002. And I have to say, uh, I didn't pay much mind again until Elon Musk, because I studied Burning Man, was trying to make these major traces in the desert. Um, and I also now am very passionate about this work because I straddle both living in Northern Nevada, calling that home, but working here in San Jose State, being a Bay Area resident for about 12 years in between. So I'm very passionate about this project. It's unfunded. It's slow, we don't take a stance, um, and I look at it on any given day from a different perspective. It's really, do you zoom in, do you zoom out? How do you describe a place objectively? And that is the challenge of the geographer. It's all about place, but how do you do it objectively? And you know, during this work, we had some major transformations in society. Think about this, we had the Me Too movement, we had Black Lives Matter, we had mega wildfires, we had the January 6th insurgency, we had a Russian invasion of Ukraine, and of course, most notably, we had a global pandemic. So my thinking about space transformed because we were starting to physically modify our surroundings to distance ourselves from one another, but also to mask ourselves from one another, and that actually changed my outcome and my view of this whole project. So it's something I'm proud of and I'm so honored to work in this multidisciplinary fashion because it's truly what it takes. If you want to get people's attention, you don't just write an article about 107,000 acres of land. You have to think of a different way to convey that. That's bigger than Santa Clara County. Right? It's just an enormous amount of land. So, you know, the sacrifices we made during the last few years they really fueled an e-commerce and that drove the, the change in the land use at TRIC, as I call it, is what it used to be called, but they rebranded themselves um, because it didn't. And it's even Story County. I mean, the names were there. They're just so right for the taking. But so I wanted to put the gaze of planning, architecture, engineering, construction, urban design, out into these broader audiences in both of my communities, just to see what people would think. And it's a case study, but of course case studies never really end when you're a geographer because places always change. And at times the research feels a lot like this, um, but it is fitting so well of this, the challenges of the terra firma, which is an exhibit quite literally about the ground beneath our feet and the dust to which we return, to use the words of the new, new um, curation. And so I want to interpret the place, but I don't want to spell it out for you. That's why we use these like no text visual ways to convey the story so that you can choose what you think about this because we're all part of the equation. And these are 
the unintended consequences of the places we plan, the places we build, the places we inhabit or don't inhabit in this case. And it's a history that's interesting. There's a lore of Story County. Since the Comstock alone, we have the complete Wild West tales of cowboys, courtesans, criminals, and crypto millionaires. And some of you might have seen some of this in the New York Times, um, but just to give you a background, there's about four key players. They're all male. Um, the first would be Senator McCarran, who, for which Las Vegas is near Port, used to be named, um, but he was a pioneer of aviation technology for the state of Nevada, so a real industry senator brought money back to the, the state. But of course he has a racist past and has been removed from a lot of the uh, place names, thankfully, and been replaced by Senator, Senator Harry Reid. Second, you have Joe Conforti, the fugitive, the murderer, who's actually the reason that we have legalized brothels in Nevada. So he, um, moved the world famous Mustang Ranch across Washoe and Story County lines back and forth until somebody would issue a building permit. And because a building permit was issued, that was the stake in the ground for legalization of prostitution in Nevada. And if you know anything about it, it's a very gendered land use. It's unique to the state of Nevada. Women are forcefully isolated to the desert they cannot be in places of population over 100,000. So there's some very interesting histories about land use that are very, very different, contrasting with the places that we sit today, just four hours away. We have the criminals, we have the crypto millionaire, Jeffrey Burns of Blockchains, who was recently unveiled the utopian city for this place. And we'll get into that. And then we had uh, Lance Gilman, whose really legacy is the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center. Can you imagine a man who owned a brothel becoming the board of county commissioners, one of three, creating a master plan, approving it himself, making everything go straight to permit without a public <coughs> process? Happening in California. Never. So these are the tales that caught my attention. Like I said, I have a long history out here, but things started getting interesting starting in the late 1990s. Uh, but in, since 2014, when this anchor came, that being the Tesla Gigafactory, um, that is when people started taking some notice of this massive change. So it's not just the, the building itself, it's the time with which it was built. This building received a permit for the world's largest by square footage in 30 days. It got a grading permit to move a mountain in seven days and was built from start to finish in 14 months. It is no longer the world's largest building. It has been surpassed by the 10 million square foot building that is the Tesla headquarters in Texas. So, same family. <laughs> okay, so we, Tracy and I, have spent three years going out to trick uh, repeatedly and just documenting the change. As she said, we walked together, we took our different perspectives and we talked about what we were seeing and tried to come up with a story or the narrative that we could convey to others. But I also interviewed uh, with planners, engineers, the original developers who were very willing to talk to me, which I was surprised, and other just people who worked there about their experiences in a lived way in which I as an outsider would never truly know. These first kind of accounts really understand the place that I can say with confidence could not happen anywhere but Nevada. And from what I surmise, turning the desert from vacant land to diversified economic engine, it's really the testament of political conflicts of interest. Lance Gilman had a vision, he had a small cadre of people who were behind him, and he was able to get himself the political power and the privilege to make this possible. And so you'll notice a utilitarian impressiveness through all of the images. There's mass, there's grading, though there's the absence of mountains where they used to be. There's ornamental vegetation, but minimally. 
And, but more impressive, I think, from a planning standpoint is just the sheer speed at which things are changing. It is truly sort of the over the border mentality. It's just that most people attribute that to the southern border rather than California's eastern border. And so I would say that it's an industrial kingdom and it successfully it did. It restored wealth from a rural county where money had been extracted and taken out of the port of San Francisco. So it restored wealth in a place that very much needed it. But the power center, as Jan had mentioned, is really so interesting to me because all of the land dealings, even up until today, which the Tri Center is sold out, but even up until very recently, all took place through the world famous Mustang Ranch. And I don't know any other real estate transactions that take place in a brothel, at least not on the books. <laughs> so I mentioned the master plan because it's so unusual for the developer to be on the board of county commissioners, but also to have a vision for such permissive zoning. And that's what makes this possible. It's that there's no process by which there's review. Nevada doesn't have a CEQA or equivalent, like there is no state environmental review. There's no one size fits all approach to planning either. If you were to consider a spectrum, and like Houston has never had zoning, uh, versus this town of celebration in Florida, which is produced by Walt Disney, even the mailbox is designed, then Story County starts making sense in this greater arc. But conceptually, you know, it might fall in the middle, but it's so stripped down that it actually happens faster than Burning Man, which is something that I've never expected, which was my previous research project. Yes, you can get a permit to build one of the world's largest buildings faster than you can get a theme camp tent site. And that's all within the same region. So one thing though you will notice it's whether it's winter and there's two feet of new snow or it's summer and it's 100 and almost 10 degrees, it's always construction season. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. The region um, has been patterned and such. We're not sure if it will expand. Um, we might be coming to the end of our research, but there are plans if the state can get federal land to be privatized to expand this type of development even further to the east. And so, you just can't imagine the scale and truthfully without seeing it. But it doesn't necessarily look that appealing when you do see it. It is the desert. It is a mix of warehouses, and large manufacturing, power generation, the data center, the logistics facility, and of course, yes, the cuboid everywhere house, which is in high demand. And you even see it here, propping up along you know, 880, 680, this is the landscape of our generation. And it's the spatial reality of e-commerce. There's just this societal expectation of two-day delivery. This is what it looks like and will continue to. And now this hallmark of the new Nevada is actually an invention of Silicon Valley. The concrete tilt-up was designed right here. And so you have to ask yourself if these kinds of buildings, this kind of architecture and design is the kind of thing you want in your community or is it the kind of thing that is better suited for a place like this outside of you, lands beyond. But you know the problem is the case for scenic impacts are always at the expense of economics and this is foremost in Nevada the case because there is no state income tax, there is no uh, extensive property tax, it's very very low by comparison, and the entire system is based on industrial expansion. That each county must compete with one another, let alone the state. I would say arguably Nevada outcompetes economically to attract industry versus California. But the counties must compete with each other in such a grueling manner that they do not interact, even if they are adjacent. So what happens there affects many hundreds of thousands of people just next door without any input whatsoever. So it's a state that's 80% public land, which means it's actually highly urbanized, but the lack of environmental review means that land gets eaten up quickly. So if something becomes available that's the right size, flatness, vacancy, it means that so long as the zoning's in place, it will create a, something that looks like this, maybe larger, 
and it will be placed, unfortunately, next to residential uses, next to schools. What's so limited and what's left has become this NIMBY tension between growth and community. And so how do you start having effective conversations between the two when people realize that planning has become nothing more than the work of legal counsel? So planning by nature was a creative design process and it was about activating place and creating interrelationships between uses and filling in those voids between the, the urban design and the urban architecture. Instead, it's become the consequence of like bad design or places that don't feel right. Here in Los Gatos, you can walk the, the town square, it feels lovely, it feels great. That is all because of good planning, because choices were made to put those features where they were and to think about filling those places in between. But poor planning is what you remember. So if you remember these slides, now you know why. <laughs> so, yeah. so when you're planning for anywhere where there's very little land left, you have to be innovative. And so in all cases, industrial development is about proximity to employee headcount. It always outweighs convenience. And so it is a drawback having this kind of use so far from the Bay Area, how unsustainable that is. And this is, you know, largely what serves Northern California. But surface congestion is created because this is a location that's connected by one third of our in and out. So you have 25,000 single use automobiles that are gas powered, driving 20 plus miles each way. You have a narrow corridor with winter roads. I'm here to tell you it took me six hours. It uh, is also this shared by semi-trucks and we have 6,000 a day crossing the Sierra Crest. Um, this is not a small impact in terms of roadway capacity or just commuters or climate. So of course there are alternatives. Um, there's rail that's sort of underutilized. We have the opportunity um, to look at the sky. And so one way that my research all interconnects is not only is it Northern Nevada, but we have the co-location to five power plants that exist here. We have the proximity to Interstate 80, which connects San Francisco, Chicago, New York. We have rail, we have battery and supercharging manufacturing. We have a soon to be electric truck manufacturing. We have the flexible code, unique governance. And what's really rare, of anywhere in the West is the sheer lack of housing. This is one place that has totally removed itself from having any sort of housing allocation, which is oddly very much like Atherton, which if you know anything, they're about to lose their housing element planning to the state of California. So what an opportunity does exist is for aviation. So these are not drones, these are called EVATOLs, and I bring them up because Archer Aviation has made large announcements for San Jose. Um, these aircraft are autonomous. They fly six people or 500 pounds of cargo, 300 miles, which reaches from the port of Oakland to Tri-Center without having to deal with any of the regulations of California. So this is an opportunity to take logistics into a very easy third dimension. And it fits within a two parking spaces. You don't need a runway anymore. The battery operated technology will come drop cargo and move on. So it's both a connection to our Pacific ports, but it's also a gateway to our rural communities, which are very much in need of emergency services. So in terms of Goldilocks locations, this happens to be the one. So, Electrified transportation particularly has a competitive edge here because CEQA will hold up any sort of California development. Can you imagine having EV tolls over your skies constantly here in lovely Los Gatos? What would people say? What will people think? And yet the technology is being invented right here in San Jose and also JB, Joby Aviation down as you get closer to Marina, California. So the ecosystem that is being developed here actually has more implications for the transformation of land just over the border. Um, these commercial applications are advancing in Florida, Ohio, and Utah, and Arkansas, and with releases in 2025. 
So this is an emerging technology that is going to be something we all confront very soon. And it is a low altitude aircraft that literally flies under the radar. So ask yourselves how you feel about these kinds of changes coming to your communities and what it means to places like this, which would be very favorable. So we can't really control the air. Um, the FAA has yet to, so we really are at a, at a loss for words. Uh, we have a little more say when it comes to other natural resources like water. Um, in the West, I think we could all agree that water is the single largest obstacle to future growth. Um, there are, in the near term, issues more with sewer and sewer treatment capacities, but really water availability and water quality are our single greatest issues to tackle in terms of sustaining life in the West. And even there was a horrifying article just in the New York Times about two weeks ago about Rio Verde foothills where Maricopa County turned off the tap to 100 home sites. Um, so those are the kinds of real significant issues we're dealing with south in the Colorado River Basin, but also we will be evaluating here in the northern Truckee River, which connects Lake Tahoe with Pyramid Lake. And that is on the Paiute River, um, the Paiute River Reservation. So if you have any opinions about water, and everybody I interviewed certainly did, uh, there's what I gathered is that people have opinions, but only in other ex place examples where they're willing to use them as unifying things to talk about, shared values, to make decisions about the future. And so in Story County, which sits just outside the urban area of the Truckee Reddows regional plan, that's Reno and Sparks with 500,000 people, um, there was no interaction. 100% of the activities you see here were done without any sort of investment or public outcry from people living next door. However, when it comes to engineering, that seemed to be the only place where there was some conciliatory discussion including development of a massive canyon project that would take polluted Truckee River water and transport it to the cooling towers of industry. So instead of it being polluted water put back into the river, ultimately it just meant less water for the tribe downstream. So it's a social and environmental justice issue. So designing these systems requires sound science, but it also requires rational modeling uh, there's concern, of course, over the infrastructure. So if you might imagine if you buy a brothel on eBay from the BLM, which is how Lance Gilman ended up getting the world famous Mustang Ranch, he didn't actually have a lot of extra money to invest in the infrastructure for building the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center. So no one really knows what kind of risk or hazard or what really even exists out there. So there's a lot of concern about the critical infrastructure in the future hazard risks. So uh, I will say that there's an opportunity here for more interagency collaboration, but that's a different mindset if you look at the physical space. Here is what we uh, often call the Citadel or the Switch Campus. This fortress is a modern or contemporary fortress. This is a data center. Privacy is the ultimate investment. This is a place where uh, investors, tenants value that sort of thing and make substantial investments because they know that their information will not be readily available. And I happen to only know some of this because I slew through old real estate records and chased down shell companies. Apparently I have no life. Because those are not the kinds of things you want to be doing on a Friday night. Um, but yeah, so it's the sensitivity and extreme privacy at which you will never get the kinds of transparency that you need to tackle real questions about like, what do you do when you need to house people or educate them or have emergency services? And so these are sadly not the kinds of questions that are unique here, but rather the kinds of questions all of our communities are challenged in the West. But of course, there are striking differences. Uh, there is no transparency in Nevada versus California has a state agency that you have to report and that could be used as a, a sort of data transparency growth forecasting mechanism. And that's very much at odds with sort of a Nevada mentality. And so I go around often toting, I'm like, hey, we just need a state agency. And you can imagine how that might go over. 
that would be the last thing somebody would be promoting in the development community in Nevada. But we have to start asking these questions now because a Jeff Burns did come through and he did propose, having made millions of dollars on Ethereum, um, a blockchain utopia, a self-governed innovation zone, which would have been a donut making this its own county, its own governance, run entirely on cryptocurrency, engaged completely in market transactions that took place outside of the normal economy and was built on tax, Trump favored tax um, requirements that would have kept all the money then coming back to. So it would have been an isolated place, a very sovereign type nation around radical market experiments. Now the governor actually supported this measure up until Jeff Burns had his sex, second sexual harassment issue um, involving a nanny at my child's school. So, these are the kinds of politics of Nevada, but they had a very real likelihood of happening. Um, and that we need to be aware of these things because we have to learn from elsewhere as opposed to just purely looking to the past of the place we know. And that is a trapping of particularly Nevada, but a, a tr what I found studying place across many countries and particularly in the United States. We just fall back on what we're comfortable with. But now we're talking new, like new scales, a billion dollars in subsidies for the Tesla Gigafactory one, another billion dollar subsidy for Red Redwood Materials, which is going next door, and a third billion dollars for the Tesla truck expansion, so the factory that will produce the trucks. So how do you repay $3.3 billion? Where does that return on investment come from? And how do you fund ongoing infrastructure? How do you do capital improvements? How do you take care of long-term costs that we don't even fully understand yet? What are the costs to schools, for example, when you take that much money out of a state that doesn't have income tax? It's this real neoliberal phenomenon. It was codified here, and it's what economists call the urban growth machine. It's something we have to push back and resist whenever possible this sort of pure laissez-faire market economy. It rarely favors sustainability, and yet oddly enough, because they're Silicon Valley companies, we have a regenerative, or we have a man-made lake that's circular and that it feeds cooling centers and also becomes um, the source of the, uh, the new redwood materials. It's, it's going to help them with their recycling of that lithium ion batteries. I don't know what the byproducts of that might look like, but if you were to think about citing something like battery recycling next to a Tesla truck manufacturing, if you were not to consider the hundreds or thousands of miles driven, it is a circular economy, just very, very winding. And so this space, the 668 acres, is transforming, it's hard to see, but yes, it'll be up and running by 2024, uh, which is, and it never even was, there was not one public notice that this was happening. So it's hard to photograph, it's hard to understand the size and scale, but I'll tell you, as Tracy mentioned, as Jan mentioned, this is a people-less place. We know they're there, we've talked to them, we've seen the cars go by, but on any given day, you're more likely to see wildlife than humans. The wildlife have to navigate new corridors, new fences, new electrified you know, surveillance. But because the land is so steep, it's really only about 20% developed. So there's a lot of space for conservation. It's just no one told the bighorn sheep that they're trespassing on Google. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, how do you think about creating space for the biota? And what do you think about, you know, adding plants? So I love the austerity. I love the austerity of the desert, but I also love the austerity of our industrial landscape. And I'll tell you that there's this weird inverse relationship, like the smaller the building, the more plants you get. <laughs> but um, that relationship is, is one we have to ask, like when we screen in our communities, plants you know, to kind of hide the industry or hide what's happening there, what are we not seeing? And that's the big question. It's, it's if you look at this in the zoom scale, like maybe this all makes sense, but when you look at the small scale, you start noticing that change is really afoot. There's a fast food restaurant for the first time. There's a, it has, a, there's a bank out there. There's you now an extended stay hotel for the first time. There's 
little creeping bits of humanity that are making very real changes, even if they're temporary, they're albeit changes that will change the opinions of place and create a human geography. And human geography is, of course, what's you know relatable. Otherwise, these things happen without question for 20 years. And so introducing humans now in a more permanent context means maybe there's interesting new directions for research, but ours is running, winding down. And so I would only hope that these sort of ideas about these privileged and powerful individuals who want to design new towns and new cities, that this tech billionaire trend ends, that leave planning to the planners. Things like sidewalk labs in Toronto pulled out. Um, that was Google. Bill Gates has Belmont in Arizona, dried up. We have Mark Lohr's um, Tesora that's been secretly announced, likely in Utah, because he's an archer aviation investor, and Utah is favorable to that kind of technology. But, you know, planning is really the practice and meant for all of us. It is not just meant for a few privileged individuals. And though I can see the perspective of this economic jackpot, this geographic jackpot that exists only in this place, just over the border of California, with its space and its power and its access and its efficiency. But this is the kind of progress that Silicon Valley fuels and feeds on. But I think over the three years, because I've given you all those crises that we've experienced, what's interesting in planning is about the human stories. And so you can tell it now as a case against zoning, maybe a little more freedom for regulation, um, because planning hasn't always got it right. I mean, we have, just to name a few big issues, planning has a history of land use control being an extension of our police power. That has led to redlining, sundown towns, urban renewal, sprawl, and private automobile dependence. Not one of those things we can be proud of, and we'll have generations to try to rectify. So, like I said, this is an example of something different, not necessarily what's right for here, not necessarily what's wrong in the big picture. But I would say that the spaces that are the most human are what we should be designing. They showcase the stories of the landscape, sometimes the land being the story itself. Like I said, that's very popular right now in, in mass media. But sometimes it's to be celebrated, but sometimes it's to be condemned, and sometimes it's both. And in terms of authentic design, I really like Destination Crenshaw. I think this is a wonderful example of a transformation of space of economically overlooked places. It's self-described as reparative, a self-stamped dynamic expression of black American culture. And I would say, ask yourself, what is analogous to the African stargrass where you live, the communities that you appreciate, that, that identify with, or a place even like Trip. Whose voice and whose story would be amplified there? Is it low-wage low workers? Is it the Paiute people? Is it the sex workers at the world-famous Mustang Ranch? Is it an unpredictable social media CEO? I mean, there are just a whole host of options there, but I encourage you all on your next trip east to go just a little farther and come see what's happening because this is happening in my backyard, but it is also attributable to the decisions that are made here uh, very much in the place we sit. So I thank you all for coming tonight. This is something we're very proud of, but we have lots of time for questions, whether you wanna come talk to us individually or as a group. Thanks. <laughs>
Yeah, so there's, it's really a challenge because even at the state level, this is seen as a great success. And we have a state environmental protection agency, we have a Nevada Division of Wildlife. So there are regulatory authorities that look at great bighorn sheep, they look at eagles and other raptors. Um, there's the wild horses, although those are very contentious because they're not necessarily native, but have been around a long time. So the large game get a lot of attention. It's the small species that you're seeing. So interestingly argued, argued now between the US Fish and Wildlife Service and land development. So much of you know this is acceptable because mining has always been acceptable, if you will. But the thistle, the toad, those are the species that are getting all of the attention now. There's emergency listings. There are things that are happening very quickly because of Thacker Pass, because lithium, we're about to enter a new era of sort of the lithium boom, um, where Nevada is going to be capitalizing probably, again, more than other places in our country. And so there's this, this real push under the Biden administration, which is nice to see, to start emergency listing things so that being the only avenue by which there could be some protection of wildlife. Um, but, you know, that's not an easy process either. Any questions? Come! <laughs> okay, Henry. Sure. Um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure how to phrase this question, so forgive me if it's a little bit do you see yourself as documentarians, as advocates, as artists? Do you see yourself more as a planner? You are a planner. So what what's um, what's the biggest what's the biggest thing that you want? You encourage us to think about these things the next time you visit. You encourage us to keep these things top of mind. But what else what else do you want us to do? What's what's your goal here? Good question. A lot of hats. Yeah. So historically, I've done a lot of the planning. I'm not proud of some of the representation of projects I have in my history. Um, that said, I understand the process probably better than anyone in all of Northern Nevada when it comes to this kind of development. Um, I would say that some days I'm a strong advocate. I'm a very strong advocate of people having a voice in a process, but I ask people to sort of objectively think about Energy has to come from somewhere. Lithium is part of our green wave technology. If that is not necessarily a clean transition, but it's something we're got to sort of deal with. And these things take place here. So if we want these sort of conveniences and this technology, we have to grapple with what that means to the change of place. So some days I'm like, well, this is kind of where we're going as a society and I don't take so much of a stance. And then other days I'm just horrified and a strong advocate. So it's up to you to really decide where you fall. Um, like, ah, like it, it, the news of the Tesla truck plant did not, did not make me happy. It's the subsidies that I think personally I have the biggest issue with. These people are coming, these businesses are coming anyway geographically if you can drive to Silicon Valley, if you're on the I-80 corridor, if you don't have housing, the likelihood of these businesses coming to this location are very, very good. Why give it all away in the process? But then that's always been Nevada's history. So it's just the latest cycle. And the Bay Area's history. Oh, uh, the Bay Area's history too. Mm -hmm. Yes, Marcia. I'm just really struck by how little I personally mean knew about the interconnectedness and the impact, you can say not just environmental, but other impact. It's just such a complex web of things. And even in very highly educated Silicon Valley, people think about the electric vehicles and zero emission vehicles as kind of some kind of panacea, right? They don't sit down and think the next step. Where, you know, there has to be, you don't get something for free. So, you know, you have batteries that need to be recycled that, you know, and I'm just wondering where, is this an issue of like an education? Is it a media story? Is it, you know, in this time of ESG and stuff like that, can we kind of draw attention? This is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I can say as yeah. well, I mean, even, I'm trying to speak without the mic. Can everybody hear me in the back as well? I hate that one, sorry. <laughs> um, I can tell you right now that even in Nevada, in Reno, most people don't even notice it and yeah. it's 
20 minutes away from where most of us live. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I bring this up as a point of topic and reference other photographers in my photography classes, mm -hmm. and the students have no idea. I have colleagues that have no idea. So I think they're, they're managing to fly under the radar. Um, if you go to the New York Times and, and look up the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center, there's one article that will come up. Um, all the photographs that are made in that article are mostly glamorizing the wild horses, which again, I, you know, anyways. So I mean, there, it's creating a very specific type of image. And again, like there, yes, there's positive. It brings jobs. It, it helps, you know, sustain certain parts of the economy. These are important things. And then you have this other, you know, very heavy realistic side is what is the sustainability of a place like this, right? So it's a very complex issue. So for those of you that are like, oh my God, I had no idea. There's people in Reno, again, like 20 minutes from here that also have no clue. So I think, you know, this, I think this wonderful, thing, wonderful part about this project is that again, we're able to bring these different perspectives and just bring this awareness. I think so often uh, politically, a lot of people are like, well, okay, again, what's happening over the, again, the larger border and not even thinking on, again, this localized level. And that's the beauty, again, of doing a project such as this. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh. Well, and nobody did the work. Nobody was standing up to do this work. Nobody thought about doing a project around Tahoe Reno Industrial Center. I mean, I ask around and there's no historic archive information. This is just Tracy and Carrie driving around the desert, <laughs> like, taking pictures, you know. Um, so we're trying to describe at least a time and place for the first time. But as Jan pointed out, it has a lot, much, it's part of a much, much larger story about right. Comstock. Same place, 100 years apart. Yes, thank you. Well, let's give a round of applause. Thank you.